Wherever young composers gather in a university environment, there seems to be talk of using personal processes to generate the raw materials of composition, in fact of music itself. In practice, this means what was once called rough working, which in some form gives the composer permutations of notes, patterns of intervals, rhythms and so on. Is this a healthy obsession? How come anything other than judgment about sound has acquired a franchise to decide for us our musical building blocks? Well, we tend to forget that art is artifice. It's all skill and scaffolding, smoke and mirrors. Prior planning has to play a part in the coherent result at some level. Those spontaneous outpourings so cherished in Hollywood depictions of artists are more usually the tip of an unglamorous iceberg a below-the-surface world that some composers have preferred to keep hidden, certainly historically. The sketches that Brahms famously destroyed might have told us volumes about his laborious working practice. Such shyness is much less common in the post-tonal age, or maybe I should say the post-serial age, since one of the legacies of Schoenberg's method of composing with 12 tones in a row has been to foster a new openness about all this. Beyond all that, I think the serial method has given a whole new legitimacy to composers' background workings, shining a spotlight on what, for Schoenberg himself, was only ever the hidden foundation of it all. So this is one answer to my first question about franchising decisions out to systematic processes. To put it simply, a historical legacy of the twelve-tone method has been this new preoccupation with the musical means as well as or maybe even more than, the ends. But I think the post-tonal composer actually faces a different dilemma, and this maybe also lies behind the modern preoccupation of many of us, certainly as student composers, with background working. Abstract technique is not servicing the same function for composers after tonality because there is not the same shared assumption of territory. For example, to compare the generative processes of Brahms and Wagner in the 1860s is, as Karl Dahlhaus brilliantly explained in his book Between Romanticism and Modernism, to observe two different approaches to the same situation. Both Brahms and Wagner were seeking a detailed syntax to sustain large-scale structures. The problem was the same the approaches were the difference. But the abstract manipulations of different composers after the passing of tonality as a currency cannot be assumed to be addressing a single goal. In fact, without tonal architecture, part of this technique's job is actually to define what the goal is. No longer the individual route towards a common coherence, the modern abstracted process serves partly to focus the composer's wider concerns. It's a way of actually saying who that composer is. So, in the 1970s, those slow chordal permutations that we get at the opening of Mi Parti by Lutosławski distinguish not just his means, but his goals, what he wants in the music, from the micro polyphonies of Ligeti, say, those dense harmonic wedges, or from the rotating isorhythms and blocks of Bertwistle at the same time. Background techniques are no longer approaches to a shared purpose, but they serve to define a multiplicity of such purposes, different articulations of what new music is. Small wonder, then, that we have become considerably obsessed with them in this complex environment, and we are much more ready to declare them now. You could say that the underwear of composition is frequently worn on the outside nowadays, particularly in the cloisters of Academe. So, the responsible artist has to retain a clear perspective as to what is means and what is end. Sometimes the most laborious permutations are not about generating surface expression, which may come from other interventions. For this reason, a composer may resent being probed in dryly analytical terms. Brahms himself was said to have responded, Oh that, any damn fool can see that, when he was confronted with some thematic correspondence in a work. As a student, I also heard a story about a living composer whose systems of rotation and transformation were already widely known. But when he was asked once, how do you actually decide and determine your pitches? 
His sarcastic reply was, Oh, I write each one on a little bit of paper, throw them all up in the air and pick them up where they land. He may well have felt that what mattered was not the obsession with means, but the expressive end, and that those pitches that were asked about should have been self-explanatory. The fact is, composers know, or should know, that most of these workings are incidental, even though we've come to find in them a sort of legitimacy. I mean that the real directional punch of the music, as in art itself, comes from what is done with the data we use. Pitch successions, detailed duration series and the like are important and they get us started, but they're no more than fodder for the broader gesturing and pattern which drives the music, but paradoxically gets less discussion. If we obsess about number series, matrices, cells and so on, it's all good fun, but we risk confusing them with the content of the music when, as I say, their details may well be peripheral to the work's major artistic events and its overall progress. Schoenberg would agree. You use the method, then compose as before, he asserted about the then new 12-tone principles. But I often think serialism as a legacy has a lot to answer for. The great American writer on music, Leonard Meyer, pointed out that in Schoenberg and followers, particularly the generation after him, we may often hear fragments of a row, but, he says, in such cases our perception is of a pattern or a set of relationships which also happens to be from the row. Understanding is not dependent upon the fact that we are hearing the row. I think Schoenberg would agree that music history has mythologized means rather than end. Meanwhile, in later offshoots of serial orthodoxy in the 1950s, the so-called total serialism, that gulf between systematized source and any perceptual information and pattern has become yet wider. So wide, in fact, that to me, the prominence then accorded to this arcane Sudoku is highly suspect. There's no place in academe or the concert hall for art that hides behind process. Artistic imperative remains the thing.